Indus, Genghis Khan considered returning to Mongolia through North India and Assam, but the heat, the natural habitat and the ill portents reported by his shaman soothsayer made him change his mind. Genghis Khan died in 1227, having spent most of his life in military combat. His military achievements were astounding and they were largely a result of his ability to innovate and transform different aspects of steppe combat into extremely effective military strategies. The horse riding skills of the Mongols and the Turks provided speed and mobility to the army, their abilities rapid shooting archers from horseback were further perfected during regular hunting expeditions which doubled field maneuvers. The steppe cavalry had always traveled light and moved quickly, but now it brought all its knowledge of the terrain and the weather to do the unimaginable. They carried out campaigns in the depths of winter, treating frozen rivers as highways to enemy cities and camps. Nomads were conventionally at a loss against fortified encampments but Genghis Khan learned the importance of siege engines and naphtha bombardment very quickly. His engineers prepared light portable equipment, which was used against opponents with devastating effect. C. 1167. Birth of Temujin. 1160s to 70s. Years spent in slavery and struggle. 1180s to 90s. Period of alliance formation. 1203 to 1227. Expansion and triumph. 1206. Temujin proclaimed Genghis Khan, universal ruler, of the Mongols. 1227. Death of Genghis Khan. 1227-1260 Rule of the Three Great Khans and Continued Mongol Unity 1227-1241 Ogodai Son of Genghis Khan 1246-1249 Gayak Son of Ogodai 1251-1260 Monk Son of Genghis Khan's Youngest Son, Tulu 1236-1242 Campaigns in Russia, Hungary, Poland and Austria under Batu, Son of Jockey, Genghis Khan's Eldest Son 1253 to 1255 beginning of fresh campaigns in Iran and China under Monk 1258 capture of Baghdad and the end of the Abbasid Caliphate establishment of the Iltakhanid state of Iran under Hulag younger brother of Monk beginning of conflict between the Jakids and the Iltakhans 1260 accession of Kublai Khan as Grand Khan in Peking Conflict amongst descendants of Genghis Khan, fragmentation of Mongol realm into independent lineages, Tulu, Chigatay and Jaki, Ogodai's lineage defeated and absorbed into the Tuluyid, Tuluyids, Yuan dynasty in China and Iltakhanid state in Iran, Chigatayids in steppes north of Transoxiana and, Turkestan, Jakid lineages in the Russian steppes, described as the Golden Horde by observers 1257 to 1267, the reign of Burke, son of Batu, reorientation of the Golden Horde from Nestorian Christianity towards Islam. Definitive conversion takes place only in the 1350s. Start of the alliance between the Golden Horde and Egypt against the Iltakhans. 1295 to 1304, the reign of the Iltakhanid ruler Ghazan Khan in Iran. His conversion from Buddhism to Islam is followed gradually by other Iltakhanid chieftains. 1368, end of the Yuan dynasty in China. 1370 to 1405, rule of Timur, a Barla's Turk who claimed Genghis Khanid descent through the lineage of Chate, establishes a steppe empire that assimilates part of the dominions of Tulu, excluding China, Chigate and Jaki, proclaims himself, Gurgan, royal son to Intala, and marries a princess of the Genghis Khanid lineage 1495-1530. Zahiruddin Babur, descendant of Timur and Genghis Khan succeeds to Timurid territory of Fergana and Samarkand, is expelled, captures Kabul and in 1526 seizes Delhi and Agra, founds the Mughal Empire in India, 1500. Capture of Transoxiana by Shabana Khan, descendant of Jochis' youngest son, Shiban. Consolidates Shabana power, Shabanids also described as Izbig, from whom Uzbekistan, today, gets its name, in Transoxiana and expels Babur and other Timurids from the region. 1759, Manchus of China conquer Mongolia. 1921, Republic of Mongolia. The Mongols after Genghis Khan weaken divide Mongol expansion after Genghis Khan's death into two distinct phases, the first which spanned the years 1236 to 1242 when the major gains were in the Russian steppes, Bulgar, Kiev, Poland and Hungary. 
the second phase including the years 1255 to 1300 led to the conquest of all of China, 1279, Iran, Iraq and Syria. The frontier of the empire stabilized after these campaign. The Mongol military forces met with few reversals in the decades after 1203 but, quite noticeably, after the 1260s the original impetus of campaigns could not be sustained in the West. Although Vienna, and beyond it Western Europe, as well as Egypt was within the grasp of Mongol forces, their retreat from the Hungarian steppes and defeat at the hands of the Egyptian forces signaled the emergence of new political trends. There were two facets to this, the first was a consequence of the internal politics of succession within the Mongol family where the descendants of Jaki and Ogodai allied to control the office of the Great Khan in the first two generations. These interests were more important than the pursuit of campaigns in Europe. The second compulsion occurred as the Jaki and Ogodai lineages were marginalized by the Taluyid branch of Genghis Khanid descendants. With the accession of Monk, a descendant of Talu, Genghis Khan's youngest son, military campaigns were pursued energetically in Iran during the 1250s. But as Taluyid interests in the conquest of China increased during the 1260s, forces and supplies were increasingly diverted into the heartlands of the Mongol dominion. As a result, the Mongols fielded a small, understaffed force against the Egyptian military. Their defeat and the increasing preoccupation with China of the Taluyid family marked the end of Western expansion of the Mongols. Concurrently, conflict between the Jakid and Taluyid descendants along the Russian-Iranian frontier diverted the Jakids away from further European campaigns. The suspension of Mongol expansion in the West did not arrest their campaigns in China which was reunited under the Mongols. Paradoxically, it was at the moment of its greatest successes that internal turbulence between members of the ruling family manifested itself. The next section discusses the factors that led to some of the greatest successes of the Mongol political enterprise but also inhibited its progress. Social, political and military organization among the Mongols, and many other nomadic societies as well, all the able-bodied, adult males of the tribe bore arms, they constituted the armed forces when the occasion demanded. The unification of the different Mongol tribes and subsequent campaigns against diverse people introduced new members into Genghis Khan's army complicating the composition of this relatively small, indifferentiated body into an incredibly heterogeneous mass of people. It included groups like the Turkic Uyghurs, who had accepted his authority willingly. It also included defeated people, like the Karayids, who were accommodated in the Confederacy despite their earlier hostility. Genghis Khan worked to systematically erase the old tribal identities of the different groups who joined his confederacy. His army was organized according to the old step system of decimal units, in divisions of tens, one hundreds, one thousand s and, notionally, ten thousand soldiers. In the old system the clan and the tribe would have coexisted within the decimal units. Genghis Khan stopped this practice. He divided the old tribal groupings and distributed their members into new military units. Any individual who tried to move from his, her allotted group without permission received harsh punishment, the largest unit of soldiers, approximating 10,000 soldiers, Chumen, now included fragmented groups of people from a variety of different tribes and clans. This altered the old step social order integrating different lineages and clans and providing them with a new identity derived from its progenitor, Genghis Khan. The new military contingents were required to serve under his four sons and specially chosen captains of his army units called Noyan. The new military contingents were required to serve under his four sons and specially chosen captains of his army units called Noyan. Also important within the new realm were a band of followers who had served Genghis Khan loyally through grave adversity for many years. Genghis Khan publicly honored some of these individuals as his blood brothers and a, yet others, freemen of a humbler rank, were given special ranking as his bondsmen, Nakar, a title that marked their close relationship with their master. This ranking did not preserve the rights of the old clan chieftains, the new aristocracy derived its status from a close relationship with the great Khan of the Mongols. In this new hierarchy, Genghis Khan assigned the responsibility of governing the newly conquered people to his four sons. These comprised the four Eulis, a term that did not originally mean fixed territories. Genghis Khan's lifetime was still the age of rapid conquests and expanding domains, where frontiers were still extremely fluid. 
For example, the eldest son, Jockey, received the Russian steppes but the farthest extent of his territory, Ulus, was indeterminate, it extended as far west as his horses could roam. The second son, Chigate, was given the Trans-Oxanian steppe and lands north of the Pamir Mountains adjacent to those of his brother. Presumably, these lands would shift as Jockey marched westward. Genghis Khan had indicated that his third son, Ogodai, would succeed him as the great Khan and on accession the prince established his capital at Karakoram. The youngest son, Tulu, received the ancestral lands of Mongolia. Genghis Khan envisaged that his sons would rule the empire collectively, and to underline this point, military contingents, Tama, of the individual princes were placed in each Ulus. The sense of a dominion shared by the members of the family was underlined at the Assembly of Chieftains, Kuriltes, where all decisions relating to the family or the state for the forthcoming season, campaigns, distribution of plunder, pasture lands and succession, were collectively taken. Genghis Khan had already fashioned a rapid courier system that connected the distant areas of his regime. Fresh mounts and dispatch riders were placed in outposts at regularly spaced distances. For the maintenance of this communication system the Mongol nomads contributed a tenth of their herd, either horses or livestock, as provisions. This was called the Kabkur tax, a levy that the nomads paid willingly for the multiple benefits that it brought. The courier system, Yam, was further refined after Genghis Khan's death and its speed and reliability surprised travelers. It enabled the great Khans to keep a check on developments at the farthest end of their regime across the continental landmass. The conquered people, however, hardly felt a sense of affinity with their new nomadic masters. During the campaigns in the first half of the 13th century, cities were destroyed, agricultural lands laid waste, trade and handicraft production disrupted. Tens of thousands of people, the exact figures are lost in the exaggerated reports of the time, were killed, even more enslaved. All classes of people, from the elites to the peasantry suffered. In the resulting instability, the underground canals, called Khanats, in the arid Iranian plateau could no longer receive periodic maintenance. As they fell into disrepair, the desert crept in. This led to an ecological devastation from which parts of Khorasan never recovered. Once the dust from the campaigns had settled, Europe and China were territorially linked. In the peace ushered in by Mongol conquest, Pax Mongolica, trade connections matured. Commerce and travel along the Silk Route reached its peak under the Mongols but, unlike before, the trade routes did not terminate in China. They continued north into Mongolia and to Karakoram, the heart of the new empire. Communication and ease of travel was vital to retain the coherence of the Mongol regime and travelers were given a pass, Peza in Persian, Jaraj in Mongolian, for safe conduct. Traders paid the Baj tax for the same purpose, all acknowledging thereby the authority of the Mongol Khan. Contradictions between the nomadic and sedentary elements within the Mongol Empire eased through the 13th century. In the 1230s, for example, as the Mongols waged their successful war against the Qin dynasty in North China, there was a strong pressure group within the Mongol leadership that advocated the massacre of all peasantry and the conversion of their fields into pasture lands. But by the 1270s, when South China was annexed to the Mongol Empire after the defeat of the Sung dynasty, Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan, death 1294, appeared as the protector of the peasants and the cities. In the 1290s, the Mongol ruler of Iran, Ghazan Khan, death 1304, a descendant of Genghis Khan's youngest son Tulu, warned family members and other generals to avoid pillaging the peasantry. It did not lead to a stable prosperous realm, he advised in a speech whose sedentary overtones would have made Genghis Khan shudder. From Genghis Khan's reign itself, the Mongols had recruited civil administrators from the conquered societies. They were sometimes moved around, Chinese secretaries deployed in Iran and Persians in China. They helped in integrating the distant dominions and their backgrounds and training were always useful in blunting the harsher edges of nomadic predation on sedentary life. The Mongol Khans trusted them as long as they continued to raise revenue for their masters and these administrators could sometimes command considerable influence.
In the 1230s, the Chinese minister Yelu Jiatse muted some of Ogdai's more rapacious instincts. The Juwena family played a similar role in Iran through the latter half of the 13th century and at the end of the century, the wazir, Rashid Ading, drafted the speech that Ghazan Khan delivered to his Mongol compatriots asking them to protect, not harass, the peasantry. The pressure to sedentarize was greater in the new areas of Mongol domicile, areas distant from the original steppe habitat of the nomads. By the middle of the 13th century the sense of a common patrimony shared by all the brothers was gradually replaced by individual dynasties each ruling their separate eulis, a term which now carried the sense of a territorial dominion. This was, in part, a result of succession struggles, where Genghis Khanid descendants competed for the office of Great Khan and prized pastoral lands. Descendants of Tulu had come to rule both China and Iran where they had formed the Yuan and Ilkhanid dynasties. Descendants of Jockey formed the Golden Horde and ruled the Russian steppes, Chigatay's successors ruled the steppes of Transoxiana and the lands called Turkestan today. Noticeably, nomadic traditions persisted longest amongst the steppe dwellers in Central Asia, descendants of Chigatay, and Russia, the Golden Horde. The gradual separation of the descendants of Genghis Khan into separate lineage groups implied that their connections with the memory and traditions of a past family concordance also altered. At an obvious level this was the result of competition amongst the cousin clans and here the Taluyid branch was more adept in presenting their version of the family disagreements in the histories produced under their patronage. To a large extent this was a consequence of their control of China and Iran and the large number of literati that its family members could recruit. At a more sophisticated level, the disengagement with the past also meant underlining the merits of the regnant rulers as a contrast to other past monarchs. This exercise in comparison did not exclude Genghis Khan himself. Persian chronicles produced in Ilkhanid Iran during the late 13th century detailed the gory killings of the Great Khan and greatly exaggerated the numbers killed. For example, in contrast to an eyewitness report that 400 soldiers defended the citadel of Bukhara, an Ilkhanid chronicle reported that 30,000 soldiers were killed in the attack on the citadel. Although Ilkhanid reports still eulogized Genghis Khan, they also carried a statement of relief that times had changed and the great killings of the past were over. The Genghis Khanid legacy was important, but for his descendants to appear as convincing heroes to a sedentary audience, they could no longer appear in quite the same way as their ancestor. Following the research of David Ayalon, recent work on the Yasa, the code of law that Genghis Khan was supposed to have promulgated at the Kurilte of 1206, has elaborated on the complex ways in which the memory of the great Khan was fashioned by his successors. In its earliest formulation the term was written as Yasik which meant, law, decree, or, order. Indeed, the few details that we possess about the Yasik concern administrative regulations, the organization of the hunt, the army, postal system. By the middle of the 13th century, however, the Mongols had started using the related term Yasa in a more general sense to mean the legal code of Genghis Khan. We may be able to understand the changes in the meaning of the term if we take a look at some of the other developments that occurred at the same time. By the middle of the 13th century the Mongols had emerged as a unified people and just created the largest empire the world had ever seen. They ruled over very sophisticated urban societies, with their respective histories, cultures and laws. Although the Mongols dominated the region politically, they were a numerical minority. The one way in which they could protect their identity and distinctiveness was through a claim to a sacred law given to them by their ancestor. The Yasa was in all probability a compilation of the customary traditions of the Mongol tribes but in referring to it as Genghis Khan's code of law, the Mongol people also laid claim to a lawgiver, like Moses and Solomon, whose authoritative code could be imposed on their subjects. The Yasa served to cohere the Mongol people around a body of shared beliefs, it acknowledged their affinity to Genghis Khan and his descendants and, even as they absorbed different aspects of a sedentary lifestyle, gave them the confidence to retain their ethnic identity and impose their law upon their defeated subjects. It was an extremely empowering ideology and although Genghis Khan may not have planned such a legal code, it was certainly inspired by his vision and was vital in the construction of a Mongol universal dominion. Conclusion, situating Genghis Khan and the Mongols in world history. 
When we remember Genghis Khan today the only images that appear in our imagination are those of the conqueror, the destroyer of cities, and an individual who was responsible for the death of thousands of people. Many 13th century residents of towns in China, Iran and Eastern Europe looked at the hordes from the steppes with fear and distaste, and yet, for the Mongols, Genghis Khan was the greatest leader of all time, he united the Mongol people, freed them from interminable tribal wars and Chinese exploitation, brought them prosperity, fashioned a grand transcontinental empire and restored trade routes and markets that attracted distant travelers like the Venetian Marco Polo. The contrasting images are not simply a case of dissimilar perspectives, they should make us pause and reflect on how one, dominant, perspective can completely erase all others. Beyond the opinions of the defeated sedentary people, consider for a moment the sheer size of the Mongol dominion in the 13th century and the diverse body of people and faiths that it embraced. Although the Mongol Khans themselves belonged to a variety of different faiths, shaman, Buddhist, Christian and eventually Islam, they never let their personal beliefs dictate public policy. The Mongol rulers recruited administrators and armed contingents from people of all ethnic groups and religions. Theirs was a multi-ethnic, multilingual, multireligious regime that did not feel threatened by its pluralistic constitution. This was utterly unusual for the time, and historians are only now studying the ways in which the Mongols provided ideological models for later regimes, like the Mughals of India, to follow. The nature of the documentation on the Mongols, and any nomadic regime, makes it virtually impossible to understand the inspiration that led to the confederation of fragmented groups of people in the pursuit of an ambition to create an empire. The Mongol Empire eventually altered in its different milieus, but the inspiration of its founder remained a powerful force. At the end of the 14th century, Timur, another monarch who aspired to universal dominion, hesitated to declare himself monarch because he was not of Genghis Khanid descent. When he did declare his independent sovereignty it was as the son-in-law, Gurgen, of the Genghis Khanid family. Today, after decades of Soviet control, the country of Mongolia is recreating its identity as an independent nation. It has seized upon Genghis Khan as a great national hero who is publicly venerated and whose achievements are recounted with pride. At a crucial juncture in the history of Mongolia, Genghis Khan has once again appeared as an iconic figure for the Mongol people, mobilizing memories of a great past in the forging of national identity that can carry the nation into the future term, barbarian, is derived from the Greek barbaros which meant a non-Greek, someone whose language sounded like a random noise, barber. In Greek texts, barbarians were depicted like children, unable to speak or reason properly, cowardly, effeminate, luxurious, cruel, slothful, greedy and politically unable to govern themselves. The stereotype passed to the Romans who used the term for the Germanic tribes, the Gauls and the Huns. The Chinese had different terms for the steppe barbarians but none of them carried a positive meaning. The capture of Bukhara Juwaina, a late 13th century Persian chronicler of the Mongol rulers of Iran, carried an account of the capture of Bukhara in 1220. After the conquest of the city, Juwaina reported, Genghis Khan went to the festival ground where the rich residents of the city were and addressed them, Oh, people know that you have committed great sins, and that the great ones among you have committed these sins. If you ask me what proof I have for these words, I say it is because I am the punishment of God. If you had not committed great sins, God would not have sent a punishment like me upon you. Now one man had escaped from Bukhara after its capture and had come to Khorasan. He was questioned about the fate of the city and replied, They came, they, mined the walls, they burnt, they slew, they plundered and they departed. Listed below are some of the great Central Asian steppe confederacies of the Turks and Mongol people. They did not all occupy the same region and were not equally large and complex in their internal organization. They had a considerable impact on the history of the nomadic population but their impact on China and the adjoining regions varied. Xiong Yu, 200 BCE. Turks. Wan Wan, 400 CE. Mongols. Epthalite Huns. 400 CE. Mongols. Tachu, 550 CE. Turks. Uyghurs, 740 CE. Turks. 
Kedan, 940 CE, Mongols, estimated extent of Mongol destruction All reports of Genghis Khan's campaigns agree at the vast number of people killed following the capture of cities that defied his authority, the numbers are staggering, at the capture of Nishapur in 1220, 1,747,000 people were massacred while the toll at Herat in 1222 was 1,600,000 people and at Baghdad in 1258, 800,000, smaller towns suffered proportionately, Nasa, 70,000 dead, Baihak district, 70,000, and a ton in the Kuhistan province, 12,000 individuals were executed. How did medieval chroniclers arrive at such figures? Juwena, the Persian chronicler of the Ilkhan stated that 1,300,000 people were killed in Merv. He reached the figure because it took 13 days to count the dead and each day they counted 100,000 corpses. Ghazan Khan's speech Ghazan Khan, 1295-1304, was the first Ilkhanid ruler to convert to Islam. He gave following speech to the Mongol Turkish nomad commanders, a speech that was probably drafted by his Persian wazir Rashid Iding and included in the minister's letters, I am not on the side of the Persian peasantry. If there is a purpose in pillaging them all, there is no one with more power to do this than I. Let us rob them together. But if you wish to be certain of collecting grain and food for your tables in the future, I must be harsh with you. You must be taught reason. If you insult the peasantry, take their oxen and seed and trample their crops into the ground, what will you do in the future? The obedient peasantry must be distinguished from the peasantry who are rebels. Yasa, in 1221, after the conquest of Bukhara, Genghis Khan had assembled the rich Muslim residents at the festival ground and had admonished them. He called them sinners and warned them to compensate for their sins by parting with their hidden wealth. The episode was dramatic enough to be painted and for a long time afterwards people still remembered the incident. In the late 16th century, Abdullah Khan, a distant descendant of Jaki, Genghis Khan's eldest son, went to the same festival ground in Bukhara. Unlike Genghis Khan, however, Abdullah Khan went to perform his holiday prayers there. His chronicler, Hafizi Tanish, reported this performance of Muslim piety by his master and included the surprising comment, this was according to the Yasa of Genghis Khan. Three changing traditions. The three orders. Changing cultural traditions. Confrontation of cultures, changing traditions we have seen how, by the 9th century, large parts of Asia and America witnessed the growth and expansion of great empires, some nomadic, some based on well-developed cities and trading networks that centered on them. The difference between the Macedonian, Roman and Arab empires and the ones that preceded them, the Egyptian, Assyrian, Chinese, Mauryan, was that they covered greater areas of territory, and were continental or transcontinental in nature. The the Mongol Empire was similar. Different cultural encounters were crucial to what took place. The arrival of empires was almost always sudden, but they were almost always the result of changes that had been taking place over a long time in the core of what would become an empire. Traditions in world history could change in different ways. In Western Europe during the period from the 9th to the 17th century, much that we connect with modern times evolved slowly. The development of scientific knowledge based on experiment rather than religious belief, serious thought about the organization of government, with attention to the creation of civil services, parliaments and different codes of law, improvements in technology that was used in industry and agriculture. The consequences of these changes could be felt with great force outside Europe. As we have seen, by the 5th century CE, the Roman Empire in the West had disintegrated. In Western and Central Europe, the remains of the Roman Empire were slowly adapted to the administrative requirements and needs of tribes that had established kingdoms there. However, urban centers were smaller in Western Europe than further east. By the 9th century, the commercial and urban centers, X, London, Rome, Siena, those small could not be dismissed. From the 9th to the 11th centuries, there were major developments in the countryside in Western Europe. The church and royal government developed a combination of Roman institutions with the customary rules of tribes. 
The finest example was the Empire of Charlemagne in Western and Central Europe at the beginning of the 9th century. Even after its rapid collapse, urban centers and trading networks persisted, albeit under heavy attack from Hungarians, Vikings and others. What happened was called, feudalism. Feudalism was marked by agricultural production around castles and, manor houses, where lords of the manor possessed land that was cultivated by peasants, serfs, who pledged them loyalty goods and services. These lords in turn pledged their loyalty to greater lords who were vassals of kings. The Catholic Church, centered on the papacy, supported this state of affairs and itself possessed land. In a world where uncertainties of life, poor sense of medicine and low life expectancy were common, the Church showed people how to behave so that life after death at least would be tolerable. Monasteries were created where God-fearing people could devote themselves to the service of God in the way Catholic churchmen thought fit. Equally, churches were part of a network of scholarship that ran from the Muslim states of Spain to Byzantium, and they provided the petty kings of Europe with a sense of the opulence of the eastern Mediterranean and beyond. The influence of commerce and towns in the feudal order came to evolve and change encouraged by Mediterranean entrepreneurs in Venice and Genoa, from the 12th century. Their ships carried on a growing trade with Muslim states and the remains of the Roman Empire in the East. Attracted by the lure of wealth in these areas, and inspired by the idea of freeing holy places associated with Christ from Muslims, European kings reinforced links across the Mediterranean during the Crusades. Trade within Europe improved, centered on fairs and the port cities of the Baltic Sea and the North Sea and stimulated by a growing population. Opportunities for commercial expansion coincided with changing attitudes concerning the value of life, respect for human beings and living things that marked much of Islamic art and literature, and the example of Greek art and ideas that came to Europe from Byzantine trade encouraged Europeans to take a new look at the world, and from the 14th century, in what is called the Renaissance, especially in North Italian towns, the wealthy became less concerned with life after death and more with the wonders of life itself. Sculptors, painters and writers became interested in humanity and the discovery of the world. By the end of the 15th century, this state of affairs encouraged travel and discovery as never before. Voyages of discovery took place. Spaniards and Portuguese, who had traded with Northern Africa, pushed further down the coast of Western Africa, finally leading to journeys around the Cape of Good Hope to India, which had a great reputation in Europe as a source of spices that were in great demand. Columbus attempted to find a western route to India and in 1492 reached the islands which the Europeans called the West Indies. Other explorers tried to find a northern route to India and China via the Arctic. European travelers encountered a range of different peoples in the course of their journeys. In part, they were interested in learning from them. The papacy encouraged the work of the North African geographer and traveler Hassan al-Watson, later known in Europe as Leo Africanus, who wrote the first geography of Africa in the early 16th century for Pope Leo X. Jesuit churchmen observed and wrote on Japan in the 16th century. An Englishman Will Adams became a friend and counselor of the Japanese shogun, Tokugawa Ieyasu, in the early 17th century. As in the case of Hassan al-Watson, peoples that the Europeans encountered in the Americas often took a great interest in them and sometimes worked for them. For example an Aztec woman, later known as Dona Marina, befriended the Spanish conqueror of Mexico, courts, and interpreted and negotiated for him. In their encounters, Europeans were sometimes cautious, self-effacing and observant, even as they frequently attempted to establish trade monopolies and enforce their authority by force of arms as the Portuguese attempted to do in the Indian Ocean after Vasco da Gama's arrival in Calicut, Presente Cori Code, in 1498. In other cases, they were overbearing, aggressive and cruel and adopted an attitude of superiority to those they met, considering such people ignorant. The Catholic Church encouraged both attitudes. The Church was the center for the study of other cultures and languages, but encouraged attacks on people it saw as unchristian. From the point of view of known Europeans, the encounter with Europe varied. For much of the Islamic lands in India and China, though, Europeans remained a curiosity until the end of the 17th century. They were perceived as hardy traders and seamen who had little to contribute to their sense of the larger world. The Japanese learned some of the advantages of European technology quickly, for instance, they had begun large-scale production of muskets by the late 16th century. 
In the Americas, enemies of the Aztec Empire sometimes used Europeans to challenge the power of the Aztecs. At the same time the diseases the Europeans brought devastated the populations, leading to the death of over 90% of the people in some areas by the end of the 16th century. Timeline 3, c. 1300 to 1700, the period under consideration witnessed several major developments in Europe, including changes in agriculture and the lives of peasants. It was also marked by a range of cultural developments. This timeline draws attention to contacts between the continents, stimulated in many instances by the growth of trade. The impact of these contacts was varied. While ideas, inventions and goods were shared across continents, there was also constant warfare between kingdoms to control land, resources and access to trade routes. As a result men and women were often displaced and enslaved, if not exterminated. In many ways, the lives of people were transformed beyond recognition. Dates Africa, 1325 to 1350, Plague in Egypt, 1348 to 55, 1350 to 75, Ibn Battuta explores the Sahara 1425 to 50, Portuguese begin slave trading, 1442. 1450 to 75, Songhai Empire in West Africa established based on trading networks across the Sahara. Portuguese expeditions and settlements along the west coast of Africa, 1471 onwards. 1475 to 1500, Portuguese convert the King of Bikongo to Christianity. 1500 to 1525, African slaves taken to work on sugar plantations in America. 1510, Ottoman Turks conquer. 1600 to 20. Oyo Kingdom of Nigeria at the height of its power, centers for metal to working, 1650-75, Portuguese destroy the Congo Kingdom, 1662, dates, Europe, 1300-25 Alhambra and Granada emerge as important cultural centers in Spain. 1325 to 1350 the Hundred Years War between England and France 1337 to 1453 dot the Black Death a form of plague spreads throughout Europe 1348 1350 to 75 French peasants protest against high taxes 1358 1375 to 1400 peasant revolt in Britain 1381 Geoffrey Chaucer writes the Canterbury Tales one of the earliest compositions in English 1388 1450 to 75 the first printed book appears in Europe Leonardo da Vinci 1452 to 1519 painter architect inventor in Italy 1475 to 1500 establishment of the Tudor dynasty in England 1485 1500 to 1525 coffee from South America is drunk in Europe for the first time 1517 tobacco chocolate tomatoes and turkey are also introduced Martin Luther attempts to reform the Catholic Church, 1521, 1525 to 1550, Copernicus propounds theory about solar system, 1543, 1550 to 75, William Shakespeare, 1564 to 1616, dramatist in England. 1575 to 1600 Zacharias Jansen invents the microscope 1590s 1600 to 25 one of the first novels Don Quixote written in Spanish 1605 1625 to 50 William Harvey demonstrates that blood is pumped through the body by the heart 1628 1650 to 75 Louis XIV King of France 1638 to 1715 1675 to 1700 Peter the Great, 1682 to 1725, attempts to modernize Russia. Dates: Asia, 1350 to 75, the Ming Dynasty in China, 1368 onwards. 1450 to 75, Ottoman Turks capture Constantinople, 1453. 1500 to 1525 Portuguese entry into China opposed, driven out to Macau, 1522. 1575 to 1600 the first kabuki play staged in japan 1586 shaw abbas 1587 to 1629 of persia introduces european methods of military training 1600 to 25 tokugawa shogunate established in japan 1603 1625 to 50 all european traders with the exception of the dutch forbidden to trade with japan 1637 Manchu rule in China, 1644 onwards, which lasts for nearly 300 years. Growing demand in Europe for Chinese tea and silk.
Dates, South Asia, 1325-1350, Establishment of the Vijayanagara Empire, 1336, 1400-1425, Emergence of Regional Sultanates, 1475-1500 Vasco da Gama reaches India, 1498, 1525-1550, Babur establishes Mughal control over North India, First Battle of Panipat, 1526, 1550-75, Akbar, 1556-1605, consolidates Mughal rule, 1600-25, the establishment of the British East India Company, 1600, 1625 to 50. Construction of the Taj Mahal, 1632 to 53. Dates. Americas, 1300 to 25. Aztec capital at Tenochtitlan, Mexico, 1325. Build temples, develop irrigation systems and accounting system. Kipu, 1450 to 75. Incas establish control over Peru, 1465, 1475 to 1500. Columbus reaches the West Indies, 1492, 1500 to 1525, Spanish conquest of Mexico, 1521, 1525 to 1550, French explorers reach Canada, 1534, 1550 to 75, Spanish conquest of Peru, 1572. 1600 to 25 England sets up its first colonies in North America 1607 the first slaves are brought from West Africa to Virginia 1619 1625 to 50 the Dutch found New Amsterdam now called New York 1626 first printing press is set up in Massachusetts 1635 1650 to 75 the first sugar plantations are established in the West Indies 1654 1675 to 1700 the French colonized the Mississippi naming it Louisiana after King Louis XIV 1682 dates Australia Pacific Isla DS 1500 to 1525 Magellan, a Spanish navigator, reaches the Pacific Ocean, 1519, 1575 to 1600. Dutch sailors reach Australia by accident, 1600 to 1625. Spanish sailors reach Tahiti, 1606, 1625 to 1650. Dutch navigator Abel Tasman sails around Australia without realizing it. He then lands on Van Diemen's Land, later called Tasmania. He also reaches New Zealand, but thinks it is part of a huge land mass. Theme 6. The Three Orders. I this chapter, we shall learn about the socio-economic and political changes which occurred in Western Europe between the 9th and 16th centuries. After the fall of the Roman Empire, many groups of Germanic people from Eastern and Central Europe occupied regions of Italy, Spain and France. In the absence of any unifying political force, military conflict was frequent, and the need to gather resources to protect one's land became very important. Social organization was therefore centered on the control of land. Its features were derived from both Imperial Roman traditions and German customs. Christianity, the official religion of the Roman Empire from the 4th century, survived the collapse of Rome, and gradually spread to Central and Northern Europe. The Church also became a major landholder and political power in Europe. The three orders, the focus of this chapter, are three social categories. Christian priests, landowning nobles and peasants. The changing relationships between these three groups was an important factor in shaping European history for several centuries. Over the last 100 years, European historians have done detailed work on the histories of regions, even of individual villages. This was possible because, from the medieval period, there is a lot of material in the form of documents, details of land ownership, prices and legal cases, for example, churches kept records of births, marriages and deaths, which have made it possible to understand the structure of families and of population. The inscriptions in churches give information about traders' associations, and songs and stories give a sense of festivals and community activities. All these can be used by historians to understand economic and social life, and changes over a long period, like increase in population, or over a short period, like peasant revolts.
of the many scholars in France who have worked on feudalism, one of the earliest was Bloch. Marc Bloch (1886–1944) was one of a group of scholars who argued that history consisted of much more than just political history, international relations, and the lives of great people. He emphasized the importance of geography in shaping human history and the need to understand the collective behavior or attitudes of groups of people. Bloch's feudal society is about European particularly French, society between 900 and 1300, describing in remarkable detail social relations and hierarchies, land management and the popular culture of the period. His career was cut short tragically when he was shot by the Nazis in the Second World War. An introduction to feudalism The term, feudalism, has been used by historians to describe the economic, legal, political and social relationships that existed in Europe in the medieval era. Derived from the German word, feud, which means, a piece of land, it refers to the kind of society that developed in medieval France, and later in England and in southern Italy. In an economic sense, feudalism refers to a kind of agricultural production which is based on the relationship between lords and peasants. The latter cultivated their own land as well as that of the lord. The peasants performed labor services for the lords, who in exchange provided military protection. They also had extensive judicial control over peasants. Thus, feudalism went beyond the economic to cover the social and political aspects of life as well, although its roots have been traced to practices that existed in Roman Empire and during age of the French King Charlemagne, 742-814. Feudalism as an established way of life in large parts of Europe may be said to have emerged later, in the 11th century. France and England Gaul, a province of the Roman Empire, had two extensive coastlines, mountain ranges, long rivers, forests and large tracts of plains suited to agriculture. The Franks, a Germanic tribe, gave their name to Gaul, making it, France. From the 6th century, this region was a kingdom ruled by Frankish, French kings, who were Christian. From the 6th century, this region was a kingdom ruled by Frankish, French kings, who were Christian. The French had very strong links with the church, which were further strengthened when in 800 the Pope gave King Charlemagne the title of Holy Roman Emperor, to ensure his support. Across a narrow channel lay the island of England Scotland, which in the 11th century was conquered by a duke from the French province of Normandy. Early History of France 481. Clovis becomes King of the Franks. 486. Clovis and the Franks begin the conquest of northern Gaul. 496. Clovis and the Franks convert to Christianity. 714. Charles Martel becomes mayor of the palace. 751. Martel's son Pepin deposes the Frankish ruler, becomes king and establishes a dynasty. Wars of conquest double the size of his kingdom. 768. Pepin succeeded by his son Charlemagne. Charles the Great. 800. Pope Leo III crowns Charlemagne as Holy Roman Emperor, 840, onwards, raids by Vikings from Norway, the three orders French priests believed in the concept that people were members of one of the three, orders, depending on their work, a bishop stated, here below, some pray, others fight, still others work, thus, the three orders of society were broadly the clergy, the nobility and the peasantry, the second order, the ability priests placed themselves in the first order, and nobles in the second. The nobility had, in reality, a central role in social processes. This is because they controlled land. This control was the outcome of a practice called, vassalage. The kings of France were linked to the people by, vassalage, similar to the practice among the Germanic peoples, of whom the Franks were one. The big landowners, the nobles, were vassals of the king, and peasants were vassals of the landowners. A nobleman accepted the king as his seigneur, senior, and they made a mutual promise, the seigneur, lord. Lord, Lord, was derived from a word meaning one who provided bread, would protect the vassal, who would be loyal to him. This relationship involved elaborate rituals and exchange of vows taken on the Bible in a church. At this ceremony, the vassal received written charter or staff or even clod of earth s, symbol of the land that was being given to him by his master. The noble enjoyed a privileged status. He had absolute control over his property, in perpetuity. He could raise troops called, feudal levies. 
the Lord held his own courts of justice and could even coin his own money. He was the Lord of all the people settled on his land. He owned vast tracts of land which contained his own dwellings, his private fields and pastures and the homes and fields of his tenant peasants. His house was called a manor. His private lands were cultivated by peasants, who were also expected to act as food soldiers in battle when required, in addition to working on their own farms. The manorial estate a lord had his own manor house. He also controlled villages, some lords controlled hundreds of villages, where peasants lived. A small manorial estate could contain a dozen families, while larger estates might include 50 or 60. Almost everything needed for daily life was found on the estate. Grain was grown in the fields, blacksmiths and carpenters maintained the lord's implements and repaired his weapons, while stonemasons looked after his buildings. Women spun and wove fabric, and children worked in the Lord's wine presses. The estate had extensive woodlands and forests where the Lord's hunted. They contained pastures where his cattle and his horses grazed. There was a church on the estate and a castle for defense. From the 13th century, some castles were made bigger for use as a residence for a knight's family. In fact, in England castles were practically unknown before the Norman conquest, and developed as centers of political administration and military power under the feudal system. The manor could not be completely self-sufficient because salt, millstones and metalware had to be obtained from outside sources. Those lords who wanted a luxurious lifestyle and were keen to buy rich furnishings, musical instruments and ornaments not locally produced, had to get these from other places. The knights from the 9th century, there were frequent localized wars in Europe, the amateur peasant soldiers were not sufficient, and good cavalry was needed. This led to the growing importance of a new section of people, the knights. They were linked to the lords, just as the latter were linked to the king. The lord gave the knight a piece of land, called, fief, and promised to protect it. The fief could be inherited. It extended to anything between 1,000 and 2,000 acres or more, including a house for the knight and his family, a church and other establishments to house his dependents, besides a water mill and a wine press. As in the feudal manor, the land of the fief was cultivated by peasants. In exchange, the knight paid his lord a regular fee and promised to fight for him in war. To keep up their skills, knights spent time each day fencing and practicing tactics with dummies. A knight might serve more than one lord, but his foremost loyalty was to his own lord. In France, from the 12th century, minstrels traveled from manor to manor, singing songs which told stories, partly historical, partly invented, about brave kings and knights. In an age when not too many people could read and manuscripts were few, these traveling bards were very popular. Many manors had a narrow balcony above the large hall where the people of the manor gathered for meals. This was the minstrel's gallery, from where singers entertained nobles while they feasted. The first order, the clergy the Catholic Church had its own laws, owned lands given to it by rulers, and could levy taxes. It was thus a very powerful institution which did not depend on the king. At the head of the Western Church, was the Pope. He lived in Rome. The Christians in Europe were guided by bishops and clerics, who constituted the first order. Most villages had their own church, where people assembled every Sunday to listen to the sermon by the priest and to pray together. Everyone could not become a priest. Serfs were banned, as were the physically challenged. Women could not become priests. Men who became priests could not marry. Bishops were the religious nobility. Like lords who owned vast landed estates, the bishops also had the use of vast estates, and lived in grand palaces. The church was entitled to a tenth share of whatever the peasants produced from their land over the course of the year, called a tithe. Money also came in the form of endowments made by the rich for their own welfare and the welfare of their deceased relatives in the afterlife. Some of the important ceremonies conducted by the church copied formal customs of the feudal elite. The act of kneeling while praying, with hands clasped and head bowed, was an exact replica of the way in which a knight conducted himself while taking vows of loyalty to his lord. Similarly, the use of the term, Lord, for God was another example of feudal culture that found its way into the practices of the church. Thus, the religious and the lay worlds of feudalism shared many customs and symbols. Monks apart from the church, devout Christians had another kind of organization. Some deeply religious people chose to live isolated lives, in contrast to clerics who lived amongst people in towns and villages. They lived in religious communities called abbeys or monasteries, often in places very far from human habitation. 
Two of the more well-known monasteries were those established by St. Benedict in Italy in 529 and of Cluny in Burgundy in 910. Monks took vows to remain in the abbey for the rest of their lives and to spend their time in prayer, study and manual labor, like farming. Unlike priesthood, this life was open to both men and women, men became monks and women nuns. Except in a few cases, all abbeys were single-sec communities, that is, there were separate abbeys for men and women. Like priests, monks and nuns did not marry. From small communities of 10 or 20 men, women, monasteries grew to communities often of several hundred, with large buildings and landed estates, with attached schools or colleges and hospitals. They contributed to the development of the arts. Abbas Hildegard was a gifted musician, and did much to develop the practice of community singing of prayers in church. From the 13th century, some groups of monks, called friars, chose not to be based in a monastery but to move from place to place, preaching to the people and living on charity. By the 14th century, there was a growing uncertainty about the value and purpose of monasticism. In England, Langland's poem, Pierce Plowman, c. 1360-1370, contrasted the ease and luxury of the lives of some monks with the pure faith of simple plowmen and shepherds and poor common laborers. Also in England, Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales which had comic portraits of a nun, a monk and a friar. The church and society though Europeans became Christian, they still held on to some of their old beliefs in magic and folk traditions. Christmas and Easter became important dates from the 4th century. Christ's birth, celebrated on the 25th of December, replaced an old prayer omen festival, the date of which was calculated by the solar calendar. Easter marked the crucifixion of Christ and his rising from the dead, but its date was not a fixed one, because it replaced an older festival to celebrate the coming of spring after a long winter, dated by the lunar calendar. Traditionally, on that day, people of each village used to make a tour of their village lands. With the coming of Christianity, they continued to do this, but they called village the parish, the area under the supervision of one priest. Overworked peasants welcomed holy days, holidays because they were not expected to work then. These days were meant for prayer, but people usually spent a good part of them having fun and feasting. Pilgrimage was an important part of a Christian's life, and many people went on long journeys to shrines of martyrs or to big churches. The Third Order Peasants, free and unfree let us now turn to the vast majority of people, namely, those who sustained the first two orders. Cultivators were of two kinds, free peasants and serfs, from the verb, to serve. Free peasants held their farms as tenants of the Lord. The men had to render military service at least 40 days every year. Peasant families had to set aside certain days of the week, usually three but often more, when they would go to the Lord's estate and work there. The output from such labor, called labyrinth, would go directly to the Lord. In addition, they could be required to do other unpaid labor services, like digging ditches, gathering firewood, building fences and repairing roads and buildings. Besides helping in the fields, women and children had to do other tasks. They spun thread, wove cloth, made candles and pressed grapes to prepare wine for the Lord's use. There was one direct tax called, tale, that kings sometimes imposed on peasants, the clergy and nobles were exempted from paying this. Serfs cultivated plots of land, but these belonged to the Lord. Much of the produce from this had to be given to the Lord. They also had to work on the land which belonged exclusively to the Lord. They received no wages and could not leave the estate without the Lord's permission. The Lord claimed a number of monopolies at the expense of his serfs. Serfs could use only their Lord's mill to grind their flour, his oven to bake their bread, and his wine presses to distill wine and beer. The Lord could decide whom a serf should marry, or might give his blessing to the serf's choice, but on payment of a fee. England feudalism developed in England from the 11th century. The Angles and Saxons, from Central Europe, had settled in England in the 6th century. The country's name, England, is a variant of Angleland. In the 11th century, William, the Duke of Normandy, crossed the English Channel with an army and defeated the Saxon King of England. From this time, France and England were often at war because of disputes over territory and trade. William first had the land mapped, and distributed it in sections to 180 Norman nobles who had migrated with him. The lords became the chief tenants of the king, and were expected to give him military help. They were obliged to supply a certain number of knights to the king. They soon began to gift some of their own lands to knights who would serve them just as they in turn served the king. 
They could not, however, use their knights for private warfare, which was forbidden in England. Anglo-Saxon peasants became tenants of various levels of landholders. Factors affecting social and economic relations While members of the first two orders saw the social system as stable and unchanging, there were several processes which were transforming the system. Some of these, such as changes in the environment, were gradual and almost imperceptible. Others were more dramatic, like the changes in agricultural technology and land use. These in turn were shaped by and had an effect on the social and economic ties between lords and vassals. Let us examine these processes one by one. The environment from the 5th to the 10th centuries, most of Europe was covered with vast forests. Thus the land available for agriculture was limited. Also, peasants dissatisfied with their conditions could flee from oppression and take refuge in the forest. Europe was undergoing an intensely cold climatic spell in this period. This led to severe and prolonged winters, a shortened growing season for crops, and reduced yields from agriculture. From the 11th century, Europe entered a warm phase. Average temperatures increased, which had a profound effect on agriculture. Peasants now had a longer growing season and the soil, now less subjected to frost, could be more easily plowed. Environmental historians have noted that there was a significant receding of the forest line in many parts of Europe. This made expansion of the area under cultivation possible. Land use initially, agricultural technology was very primitive. The only mechanical aid available to the peasant was the wooden plow, drawn by a team of oxen. This plow could at best scratch the surface of the earth and was unable to fully draw out the natural productivity of the soil. Agriculture was therefore very labor-intensive. Fields had to be dug by hand, often once in four years, and enormous manual labor was required. Also, an ineffective method of crop rotation was in use. The land was divided in half, one field was planted in autumn with winter wheat, while the other field was left fallow. Rye was planted on this piece of fallow land the next year while the other half was put to fallow. With this system, the soil slowly deteriorated, and famines were not uncommon. Chronic malnutrition alternated with devastating famines and life was difficult for the poor. Despite these hardships, the lords were anxious to maximize their incomes. Since it was not possible to increase output from the land, the peasants were forced to bring under cultivation all the land in the manorial estate, and spend more time doing this than they were legally bound to do. The peasants did not bow quietly to oppression. Since they could not protest openly, they resorted to passive resistance. They spent more time cultivating their own fields, and kept much of the product of that labor for themselves. They also avoided performing unpaid extra services. They came into conflict with the lords over pasture and forest lands, and saw these lands as resources to be used by the whole community, while the lords treated these as their private property. E.W. Agricultural Technology By the 11th century, there is evidence of several technological changes. Instead of the basic wooden plows, cultivators began using heavy iron-tipped plows and moldboards. These plows could dig much deeper and the moldboards turned the topsoil properly. With this the nutrients from the soil were better utilized. The methods of harnessing animals to the plow improved. Instead of the neck harness, the shoulder harness came into use. This enabled animals to exert greater power. Horses were now better shod, with iron horseshoes, which prevented foot decay. There was increased use of wind and water energy for agriculture. More water-powered and wind-powered mills were set up all over Europe for purposes like milling corn and pressing grapes. There were also changes in land use. The most revolutionary one was the switch from a two-field to a three-field system. In this, Peasants could use a field two years out of three if they planted it with one crop in autumn and a different crop in spring a year and a half later. That meant that farmers could break their holdings into three fields. They could plant one with wheat or rye in autumn for human consumption. The second could be used in spring to raise peas, beans and lentils for human use, and oats and barley for the horses. The third field lay fallow. Each year they rotated the use among the three fields. With these improvements, there was an almost immediate increase in the amount of food produced. From each unit of land, food availability doubled. The greater use of plants like peas and beans meant more vegetable proteins in the diet of the average European and a better source of fodder for their animals. For cultivators, it meant better opportunities. They could now produce more food from less land. The average size of a peasant's farm shrank from about 100 acres to 20 to 30 acres by the 13th century. 
Holdings which were smaller could be more efficiently cultivated and reduced the amount of labor needed. This gave the peasants time for other activities. Some of these technological changes cost a lot of money. Peasants did not have enough money to set up water mills and windmills. Therefore the initiative was taken by the lords. But peasants were able to take the initiative in many things, such as extending arable land. They also switched to the three-field rotation of crops, and set up small forges and smithies in the villages, where iron-tipped plows and horseshoes were made and repaired cheaply. From the 11th century, the personal bonds that had been the basis of feudalism were weakening, because economic transactions were becoming more and more money-based. Lords found it convenient to ask for rent in cash, not services, and cultivators were selling their crops for money, instead of exchanging them for other goods, to traders, who would then take such goods to be sold in the towns. The increasing use of money began to influence prices, which became higher in times of poor harvests. In England, for instance, agricultural prices doubled between the 1270s and the 1320s. A fourth order, E.W. Towns and Townspeople expansion in agriculture was accompanied by growth in three related areas population, trade and towns. From roughly 42 million in 1000, Europe's population stood at 62 million around 1273 million in 1300. Better food meant a longer lifespan. By the 13th century, an average European could expect to live 10 years longer than in the 8th century. Women and girls had shorter lifespans compared to men because the latter ate better food. The towns of the Roman Empire had become deserted and ruined after its fall, but from the 11th century, as agriculture increased and became able to sustain higher levels of population, towns began to grow again. Peasants who had surplus grain to sell needed a place where they could set up a selling center and where they could buy tools and cloth. This led to the growth of periodic fairs and small marketing centers which gradually developed town-like features, a town square, a church, roads where merchants built shops and homes, an office where those who governed the town could meet. In other places, towns grew around large castles, bishops' estates, or large churches. In towns, instead of services, people paid a tax to the lords who owned the land on which the town stood. Towns offered the prospect of paid work and freedom from the lords' control, for young people from peasant families. Town air makes free, was a popular saying. Many serfs craving to be free ran away and hid in towns. If a serf could stay for one year and one day without his lord discovering him, he would become a free man. Many people in towns were free peasants or escaped serfs who provided unskilled labor. Shopkeepers and merchants were numerous. Later there was need for individuals with specialized skills, like bankers and lawyers. The bigger towns had populations of about 30,000. They could be said to have formed a fourth order. The basis of economic organization was the guild. Each craft or industry was organized into a guild, an association which controlled the quality of the product, its price and its sale. The guild hall was a feature of every town. It was a building for ceremonial functions and where the heads of all the guilds met formally. Guards patrolled the town walls and musicians were called to play at feasts and in civic processions, and innkeepers looked after travelers. By the 11th century, new trade routes with West Asia were developing. Scandinavian merchants were sailing south from the North Sea to exchange furs and hunting hawks for cloth. English traders came to sell tin. In France, by the 12th century, commerce and crafts began to grow. Earlier, craftsmen used to travel from manor to manor, now they found it easier to settle in one place where goods could be produced and traded for food. As the number of towns grew and trade continued to expand, town merchants became rich and powerful, and rivaled the power of the nobility. Cathedral towns One of the ways that rich merchants spent their money was by making donations to churches. From the 12th century, large churches, called cathedrals, were being built in France. These belonged to monasteries, but different groups of people contributed to their construction with their own labor, materials or money. Cathedrals were built of stone, and took many years to complete. As they were being built, the area around the cathedrals became more populated, and when they were completed they became centers of pilgrimage. Thus, small towns developed around them. Cathedrals were designed so that the priest's voice could be heard clearly within the hall where large numbers of people gathered, and so that the singing by monks could sound beautiful and the chiming bells calling people to prayer could be heard over a great distance. Stained glass was used for windows. 
During the day the sunlight would make them radiant for people inside the cathedral, and after sunset the light of candles would make them visible to people outside. The stained glass windows narrated the stories in the Bible through pictures, which illiterate people could read. The crisis of the 14th century by the early 14th century, Europe's economic expansion slowed down. This was due to three factors. In Northern Europe, by the end of the 13th century the warm summers of the previous 300 years had given way to bitterly cold summers. Seasons for growing crops were reduced by a month and it became difficult to grow crops on higher ground. Storms and oceanic flood destroyed many farmsteads, which resulted in less income in taxes for governments. The opportunities offered by favorable climatic conditions before the 13th century had led to large-scale reclamation of the land of forests and pastures for agriculture, but intensive plowing had exhausted the soil despite the practice of the three-field rotation of crops, because clearance was not accompanied by proper soil conservation. The shortage of pasturage reduced the number of cattle. Population growth was outstripping resources, and the immediate result was famine. Severe famines hit Europe between 1315 and 1317, followed in the 1320s by massive cattle deaths. In addition, trade was hit by a severe shortage of metal money because of a shortfall in the output of silver mines in Austria and Serbia. This forced governments to reduce the silver content of the currency, and to mix it with cheaper metals. The worst was yet to come. As trade expanded in the 13th and 14th centuries, ships carrying goods from distant countries had started arriving in European ports. Along with the ships came rats, carrying the deadly bubonic plague infection, the Black Death. Western Europe, relatively isolated in earlier centuries, was hit by the epidemic between 1347 and 1350. The modern estimate of mortality in that epidemic is that 20% of the people of the whole of Europe died, with some places losing as much as 40% of the population. As trade centers, cities were the hardest hit. In enclosed communities like monasteries and convents, when one individual contracted the plague, it was not long before everyone did. And in almost every case, none survived. The plague took its worst toll among infants, the young and the elderly. There were other relatively minor episodes of plague in the 1360s and 1370s. The population of Europe, 73 million in 1300, stood reduced to 45 million in 1400. This catastrophe, combined with the economic crisis, caused immense social dislocation. Depopulation resulted in a major shortage of labor. Serious imbalances were created between agriculture and manufacture, because there were not enough people to engage in both equally. Prices of agricultural goods dropped as there were fewer people to buy. Wage rates increased because the demand for labor, particularly agricultural labor, rose in England by as much as 250% in the aftermath of the Black Death. The surviving labor force could now demand twice their earlier wages. Social unrest The income of lords was thus badly hit. It declined as agricultural prices came down and wages of laborers increased. In desperation, they tried to give up the money contracts they had entered into and revive labor services. This was violently opposed by peasants, particularly the better educated and more prosperous ones. In 1323, Peasants revolted in Flanders, in 1358 in France, and in 1381 in England. Though these rebellions were ruthlessly crushed, it is significant that they occurred with the most violent intensity in those areas which had experienced the prosperity of the economic expansion, a sign that peasants were attempting to protect the gains they had made in previous centuries. Despite the severe repression, the sheer intensity of peasant opposition ensured that the old feudal relations could not be reimposed. The money economy was too far advanced to be reversed. Therefore, though the lords succeeded in crushing the revolts, the peasants ensured that the feudal privileges of earlier days could not be reinvented. 11th to 14th centuries 1066. Normans defeat Anglo-Saxons and conquer England. 1100 onwards. Cathedrals being built in France, 1315 to 1317. Great Famine in Europe, 1347 to 1350. Black Death, 1338 to 1461. Hundred Years' War between England and France, 1381. Peasants' Revolts, 
Political changes developments in the political sphere paralleled social processes. In the 15th and 16th centuries, European kings strengthened their military and financial power. The powerful new states they created were as significant for Europe as the economic changes that were occurring. Historians have therefore called these kings, the new monarchs, Louis Xi in France, Maximilian in Austria, Henry V in England and Isabel and Ferdinand in Spain were absolutist rulers, who started the process of organizing standing armies, a permanent bureaucracy and national taxation and, in Spain and Portugal, began to play a role in Europe's expansion overseas. The most important reason for the triumph of these monarchies was the social changes which had taken place in the 12th and 13th centuries, the dissolution of the feudal system of lordship and vassalage, and the slow rate of economic growth had given the first opportunity to kings to increase their control over their powerful and not-so-powerful subjects. Rulers dispensed with the system of feudal levies for their armies and introduced professionally trained infantry equipped with guns and siege artillery directly under their control. The resistance of the aristocracies crumbled in the face of the firepower of the kings. The E.W. Monarchy 1461-1559, New Monarchs in France, 1474-1556, New Monarchs in Spain, 1485-1547, New Monarchs in England. By increasing taxes, monarchs got enough revenues to support larger armies and thus defended and expanded their frontiers and overcame internal resistance to royal authority. Centralization, however, did not occur without resistance from the aristocracy. A common thread running through all types of opposition to the monarchies was the question of taxation. In England, rebellions occurred and were put down in 1497, 1536, 1547, 1549 and 1553. In France, Louis XI, 1461 to 1483, had to wage a long struggle against dukes and princes. Lesser nobles, often members of local assemblies, resisted this royal usurpation of their powers. The religious wars in France in the 16th century were in part a contest between royal privileges and regional liberties. The nobility managed a tactical shift in order to ensure their survival. From being opponents to the new regimes, they quickly transformed themselves into loyalists. It is for this reason that royal absolutism has been called a modified form of feudalism. Precisely the same class of people who had been rulers in the feudal system, the lords, continued to dominate the political scene. They were given permanent positions in the administrative service, but the new regimes were different in some important ways. The king was no longer at the apex of a pyramid where loyalty had been a matter of personal dependence and trust. He was now at the center of an elaborate courtier society and a network of patron-client relationships. All monarchies, weak or powerful, needed the cooperation of those who could command authority. Patronage became the means of ensuring such cooperation, and patronage could be given or obtained by means of money. Therefore money became an important way in which non-aristocratic elements like merchants and bankers could gain access to the court. They lent money to the kings, who used it to pay the wages of soldiers. Rulers thus made space for non-feudal elements in the state system. The later history of France and England was to be shaped by these changes in the power structures. In the reign of the chilled King Louis XIII of France, in 1614, a meeting was held of the French Consultative Assembly, known as the Estates General, with three houses to represent the three estates, orders, clergy, nobility, and the rest. After this, it was not summoned again for nearly two centuries, till 1789, because the kings did not want to share power with the three orders. What happened in England was very different. Even before the Norman conquest, the Anglo-Saxons had a great council, which the king had to consult before imposing any tax. This developed into what was called the Parliament, which consisted of the House of Lords, the members of which were the Lords and the Clergy, and the House of Commons, representing towns and rural areas. King Charles I ruled for 11 years, 1629 to 1640, without calling Parliament. When he was forced to call it, because he needed money, a section of Parliament decided to go to war against him, and later executed him and established a republic. This did not last long, and monarchy was restored, but on the condition that Parliament would be called regularly. Today, France has a republican form of government and England has a monarchy. This is because of the different directions that the histories of the two countries took after the 17th century.
The term, medieval era, refers to the period in European history between the 5th and the 15th centuries. In the 12th century, Abbas Hildegard of Bingen wrote, who would think of herding his entire cattle in one stable, cows, donkeys, sheep, goats, without difference. Therefore it is necessary to establish difference among human beings, so that they do not destroy each other. God makes distinctions among his flock, in heaven as on earth, all are loved by him, yet there is no equality among them. Abbey is derived from the Syriac Abba, meaning father, and Abbey was governed by an abbot or an abbess. If my dear Lord is slain, his fate I shall share. If he is hanged, then hang me by his side. If to the stake he goes, with him I shall burn, and if he's drowned, then let me drown with him. Dune de Mayence, a 13th century French poem, to be sung, recounting the adventures of knights. The word, monastery, is derived from the Greek word, monas, meaning someone who lives alone. In Benedictine monasteries, there was a manuscript with 73 chapters of rules which were followed by monks for many centuries. Here are some of the rules they had to follow. Chapter 6 permission to speak should rarely be granted to monks. Chapter 7, humility means obedience. Chapter 33, no monk should own private property. Chapter 47, idleness is the enemy of the soul, so friars and sisters should be occupied at certain times in manual labor, and at fixed hours in sacred reading. Chapter 48, the monastery should be laid out in such a way that all necessities be found within its bounds, water, mill, garden, workshops. When in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root and the small birds are making melody that sleep away the night with open eye, so nature pricks them and their heart engages, then people long to go on pilgrimages, and palmers long to seek the foreign shrines of far-off saints, revered in various lands, and especially from every shire of England, to Canterbury they make their journey. Geoffrey Chaucer, c. 1340-1400, The Canterbury Tales. This was written in Middle English, and the verse is a translation in Modern English. Because of the inadequacy which we often felt on feast days, for the narrowness of the place forced the women to run towards the altar upon the heads of the men with much anguish and noisy confusion, we decided, to enlarge and amplify the noble church, we also caused to be painted, by the exquisite hands of many masters from different regions, a splendid variety of new windows, because these windows are very valuable on account of their wonderful execution and the profuse expenditure of painted glass and sapphire glass, we appointed an official master craftsman for their protection, and also a goldsmith, dot who would receive their allowances, namely, coins from the altar and flour from the common storehouse of the brethren, and who would never neglect their duty, to look after these works of art. Abbot Sugar, 1081-1151, about the Abbey of St. Denis, near Paris. How many valiant men, how many fair ladies, had breakfast with their kinfolk and the same, night supped with their ancestors in the next world. The condition of the people was pitiable to behold. They sickened by the thousands daily, and died unattended and without help. Many died in the open street, others dying in their houses, made it known by the stench of their rotting bodies. Consecrated churchyards did not suffice for the burial of the vast multitude of bodies, which were heaped by the hundreds in vast trenches, like goods in a ship's hold and covered with a little earth. Giovanni Boccaccio, 1313-1375, Italian author. Theme 7 Changing Cultural Traditions From the 14th to the end of the 17th century, towns were growing in many countries of Europe. A distinct, urban culture also developed. Townspeople began to think of themselves as more civilized than rural people. Towns, particularly Florence, Venice and Rome, became centers of art and learning. Artists and writers were patronized by the rich and the aristocratic. The invention of printing at the same time made books and prints available to many people, including those living in distant towns or countries. A sense of history also developed in Europe, and people contrasted their modern world with the ancient one of the Greeks and Romans. Religion came to be seen as something which each individual should choose for himself. The Turks' Earth-centric belief was overturned by scientists who began to understand the solar system, and new geographical knowledge overturned the Europa-centric view that the Mediterranean Sea was the center of the world. There is a vast amount of material on European history from the 14th century, documents, printed books, paintings, sculptures, buildings, textiles. 
Much of this has been carefully preserved in archives, art galleries and museums in Europe and America. From the 19th century, historians used the term, Renaissance, literally, rebirth, to describe the cultural changes of this period. The historian who emphasized these most was a Swiss scholar, Jacob Burkhardt, 1818-97, of the University of Ball in Switzerland. He was a student of the German historian Leopold von Rank, 1795-1886. Rank had taught him that the primary concern of the historian was to write about states and politics using papers and files of government departments. Burkhardt was dissatisfied with these very limited goals that his master had set out for him. To him politics was not the be-all and end-all in history writing. History was as much concerned with culture as with politics. In 1860, he wrote a book called The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, in which he called his readers' attention to literature, architecture and painting to tell the story of how a new, humanist, culture had flowered in Italian towns from the 14th to the 17th century. This culture, he wrote, was characterized by a new belief, that man, as an individual, was capable of making his own decisions and developing his skills. He was, modern, in contrast to, medieval, man whose thinking had been controlled by the church. The revival of Italian cities after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, many of the towns that had been political and cultural centers in Italy fell into ruin. There was no unified government, and the Pope in Rome, who was sovereign in his own state, was not a strong political figure. While Western Europe was being reshaped by feudal bonds and unified under the Latin Church, and Eastern Europe under the Byzantine Empire, and Islam was creating a common civilization further west, Italy was weak and fragmented. However, it was these very developments that helped in the revival of Italian culture. With the expansion of trade between the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic countries, the poor Ports on Italian contents units early society s empires changing tradition s towards modernization n one e early societies from the One of the most vibrant cities was Venice, another was Genoa. They were different from other parts of Europe, the clergy were not politically dominant here, nor were there powerful feudal lords. Rich merchants and bankers actively participated in governing the city, and this helped the idea of citizenship to strike root. Even when these towns were ruled by military despots, the pride felt by the townspeople in being citizens did not weaken. The 14th and 15th centuries 1300 Humanism taught at Padua University in Italy. 1341. Petrarch given title of Poet Laureate in Rome. 1349. University established in Florence. 1390. Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales published. 1436. Brunelleschi designs the Duomo in Florence. 1453. Ottoman Turks defeat the Byzantine ruler of Constantinople. 1454. Gutenberg prints the Bible with movable type. 1484. Portuguese mathematicians calculate latitude by observing the sun. 1492. Columbus reaches America. 1495. Leonardo da Vinci paints the Last Supper. 1512. Michelangelo paints the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Universities and humanism The earliest universities in Europe had been set up in Italian towns. The universities of Padua and Bologna had been centers of legal studies from the 11th century. Commerce being the chief activity in the city, there was an increasing demand for lawyers and notaries, a combination of solicitor and record keeper, to write and interpret rules and written agreements without which trade on a large scale was not possible. 
Law was therefore a popular subject of study, but there was now a shift in emphasis. It was studied in the context of earlier Roman culture. Francesco Petrarch, 1304-78, represented this change. To Petrarch, antiquity was a distinctive civilization which could be best understood through the actual words of the ancient Greeks and Romans. He therefore stressed the importance of a close reading of ancient authors. This educational program implied that there was much to be learned which religious teaching alone could not give. This was the culture which historians in the 19th century were to label, humanism. By the early 15th century, the term, humanist, was used for masters who taught grammar, rhetoric, poetry, history and moral philosophy. The Latin word humanitas, from which humanities was derived, had been used many centuries ago by the Roman lawyer and essayist Cicero, 106-43 BCE, a contemporary of Julius Caesar, to mean culture. These subjects were not drawn from or connected with religion, and emphasized skills developed by individuals through discussion and debate. These revolutionary ideas attracted attention in many other universities, particularly in the newly established university in Petrarch's own hometown of Florence. Till the end of the 13th century, this city had not made a mark as a center of trade or of learning, but things changed dramatically. 15th century a city is known by its great citizens as much as by its wealth, and Florence had come to be known because of Dante Alighieri, 